Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz superstar bassist Christian McBride. He's always on the verge of something new, and now it happens to be 2017 CD called Bringing It, and he always is. He was raised in a city steeped in soul, Philadelphia, and in 1989 he moved to New York to pursue classical studies at the Juilliard School. Since then, he has produced a massive body of work as a recording artist, radio show host, collaborator, and a ultimate jazz force. Please get to know Christian a little bit better and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, thank you for taking a minute out. It's an honor to speak with you. Thank you. So I'm going to just dive right in here, and I want to talk to you about this fantastic new album, Bringing It. Talk to me about this album. How do you feel about it? I feel good about it. We actually recorded it uh, quite some time ago, maybe three years ago. And uh took a little while to come out because uh I had planned on another recording coming out before this, uh, but it, it didn't work out quite that way, so we put out Bringing It instead. But uh I'm always happy to work with the big band. This band really sort of encompasses everything I love. You know, I, I, I obviously get to play, I get to write, I get to arrange. It's sort of a vehicle for, you know, for some showmanship and when we play live, you know, so... uh Everything I love about music is inside this band. You know, on the American jazz landscape, the big band seems to be something that's kind of a lost art that gets reinvented, or to a certain degree, it's a vehicle that's always gaining steam. How do you see the big band? It's such an eclectic, large voice in jazz. How do you feel about it? I think I've seen, at least in my 28 years of being on the scene, you know, from moving to New York, I've seen a number of really good big bands. You know, they they might not get a sort of uh, critical recognition that they, that they deserve, but, I mean, I can remember coming to New York and seeing Gil Evans' big band at Sweet Basil every week uh, or Maria Schneider's big band at Visione's or uh, Lester Bowie's Brass Fantasy or Oliver Lake's big band. So and then McCoy Tyner's big band was working a lot back then. So big bands have always been around, and I and I think, like you said, they've always been reinventing themselves. There's a lot of different sounds that you can go hear. There's no one particular, uh, you know, standard big band sound, you know, because uh, there's a lot of different types of big bands out there now. Same same thing with now, you know, with. Uh, you got my big band, or Darcy James argues big band, with, you know, which coming from two different places, you know. So, and you got John Beasley's Orchestra, you know. And so, uh, I, I like the big band scene. You know, I mean, it's hard to keep any of these bands together just because, you know, financially, it's always been a burden to, to keep a big band. And if you live in New York, you know, there's always a joke that, you know, if, if you if you have a big band and you live in New York, chances are. And 50% of the band plays in all the other big bands around New York. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So let me ask you about your your years of being on the scene of releasing albums. What's your view on releasing an album? Is it a period piece? Is it an evolution for you? What do you see that carbon imprint of your jazz walk as being each successive time? Funny you would ask me that, because I, I was just thinking about that last night. You know, sort of like, what, what does it mean to release an album and try to sell it in a world where good music is judged by, well, often good music is judged by how much it sells. That, that's hardly been the case in jazz. I mean, unless you, I mean, obviously Kind of kind of Blue is a great album and should have sold the, the, the numbers that it has. But uh, I think it's an evolution. I think they're, it's all about history. You know, it's all about watching someone's growth. If you want to develop as a musician, you can go back and and reference where a particular artist was at any particular time in their development. That's what you use for inspiration and for information. I, I think these are uh, pieces of history. You know, that that's part of an evolution. And if it sells, great. But I don't think that's why uh, jazz musicians play this music in the first place. Absolutely. Speaking of evolution, we're going to go to the beginnings of your life in Philadelphia. What was so great about being raised in Philadelphia and getting that jazz mentality that you got? I wouldn't have been able to answer that question while I was in Philly, but now, now that I've you know left Philly quite some time ago, I can tell you that uh, everything was happening there. You know, it had a great symphony orchestra, it had a it had a great jazz scene, it had a great R and B scene, it had a great rock scene, uh, it had a lot of 
the music education was uh, really at a peak uh, my years growing up there. So uh, it trained you for any and everything. You know, there, there was no place you couldn't go in the city and uh, not be inspired by some great musician doing something somewhere, you know. So let me ask you this about New York City. When you did go to New York City for the first time, was it were you be speckled by it? Was it just the, the arriving in the cradle of jazz? Yes, I couldn't have been more excited. I knew it was Philadelphia, you know, times 100, you know, just in terms of the the population and the level of inspiration uh, that that would be in the city. I, I knew it was going to be overwhelming, but something I was looking forward to jumping right in. You know, early on in your career, you were kind of adopted, so to speak, by the great Bobby Watson, and you really learned quite a bit from him. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he's in Kansas City now teaching the future of jazz at UMKC. So well, I want to ask you this. With all these great players that you've been around, like Bobby Watson and all of these others, what did these legendary torchbearers of the jazz arts give to you to make you a great teacher to the younger cats that you play with? An opportunity. Anytime somebody like Bobby Watson or James Williams or Mulgrew Miller, they give you a gig, that's the equivalent of being able to sit at the table and, and – talk to a legend or, or just, just learn from a legend. And uh, th there's always the romantic notion that when you walk away from a gig, you have a long list of life lessons that you've learned. Like somehow the band leader puts his arm around your shoulder and says, here's the secret to life, young man, or here's the <laughs> secret to becoming a better musician. It's never like that. A lot of lessons you learn, you don't even learn for years or decades after you've been there. I think that's what life is all about. You can learn something from anybody because I think everybody on this planet knows a little something different than what you know. So obviously when you're around elders, they've been on the planet longer and you respect their opinions or, or, or their wisdom more. But uh, I can say I've learned a little something from everybody I've ever been around. And, and uh, I, I can't put it in a nice, neat package to tell you what that's been, because there's been little tiny things here and there, but uh, I think everybody should be open to learning from uh, from everybody. You know, no, nobody really has all the answers, and I mean, two great jazz musicians could have wildly differentiating concepts on a particular thing, so you learn from both of them, you know. Absolutely. So let me hone in on something a little bit more specific here and ask you this. In your career, you've had opportunities to travel the world, to play with the best in the business. You've won awards. Is there anything that really floored you in your career that you got, whether it was an accolade or an opportunity to go to a region, a geographical region, or play with somebody that just really got you and you were like, man, that's, that's cool? Playing with James Brown, I mean, that was probably the, uh, the peak of my entire life. Um, I, I was... I was sure that I was going to be suffering from some sort of depression after it happened because uh, that's something I wanted my whole life. And I finally get to play with James Brown. And I remember thinking, well, what, what's going to happen now? Nothing I could ever experience in life will be this good. Uh, fortunately, I, I wound up not having that depression. <laughs> and I wound up ha uh, very much enjoying everything that came after that. But, uh, yeah, playing with James Brown was definitely the uh, the greatest musical moment of my life. You know, the one thing about your career is that you're always pushing the boundaries of who you are, whether you're doing work on your own with quintets, with big bands, hosting and producing a radio show. What has consistently made you want to push the envelope and move further and do more and diversify in the world of jazz? Uh, to learn, you know, um, I never, I've, I've never enjoyed being sort of uh, comfortable, you know, fi finding a, a particular groove that works, and then and, and say, okay, well, I'll stick with this because it works. I think the only way you grow as a person, much less a musician, is uh, if you're around people who you have to, you actually have to work to find a groove with. You know, uh, put yourself in some unfamiliar territory on a regular basis. That's that's really how you learn. You know, that whole thing of finding the groove and staying there, that's just that's too easy. Yeah. So let me ask you a very simple question here. Why do you love jazz? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it's uh probably it's probably the only style of music you actually get to uh invent new creative ideas every single measure while staying grounded in in a particular groove or a particular harmony or something like that you have these rules that you can bend uh unlike pop music where the the main goal of the music is to stick to the script that that got you there you know whereas jazz you're you're free to to invent and create all the time that's a great thing without a doubt so everyone has a version of christian mcbride your family your friends your fans your business associates but when you wake up you face the world you are who you are who are you that's a good question i i honestly think i'm a regular dude i'm a regular guy who uh I like to sit out in the back patio and smoke my pipe and and watch football highlights and have the guys over and talk about politics and ideas and things like I I don't think I've I don't think anybody anyone would ever uh, coin me as eccentric, you know, or or, or the uh tortured artist type, you know. I was deeply influenced by by my grandfather who was a uh who worked for the US Postal Service for 40 years. I just remember every once in a while he would take me to the depot with him, and uh, I just love the fact that here all these fellow postmen, you know, you had some uh, uh, Italian-American guys, you had some Asian guys, you had black guys, you had white guys, and they were all sitting around laughing and telling jokes, and just that whole everyday kind of hard-working guy, uh, they all loved my grandfather, and my grandfather loved them back, so I, I think... Uh, I think that's the kind of guy I am. Right on. That's perfect. That's a great way to wrap everything up. Christian, I know your time is precious. Thank you for taking a minute out for me here at Neon Jazz. And thank you very much for all the music you've given the world. I appreciate it. Oh, that's very kind of you. You got it, my man. Thank you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Philadelphia, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Christian for his music and his cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.